the uh, educators here at the lab. And this morning we are going to chat with Ed Kim and Reagan Bruno about um, ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, and uh, some of the ways that they use those that technology in the um, research that the Fisheries Ecology Lab does. So these guys work in our Fisheries Ecology Lab. And with that, I'm going to let them tell you about it. Yep. So hi, welcome everybody, and thank you for coming out to our boardwalk talk. My name, like Mendel said, is Ed Kim. I'm a graduate student here at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. This is Reagan Bruno, who's a technician with us, and we, work, we both work in the Fisheries Ecology Lab here. And the title of our boardwalk talk is Our Eyes Underwater. <laughs> and the reason for that is this right next to me. So this is an ROV, which stands for a remotely operated vehicle. A remotely operated vehicle is something that we can use to explore underwater deeper and longer than we normally would, uh, say, just by scuba diving. And this allows us to do all sorts of cool studies on fish and artificial reefs in Alabama. But before we get into that work, uh, I just want to talk about a few things about the ROV that lets us accomplish all the work that we're able to do with it. Uh, so probably the first, there's a lot of working parts to an ROV, uh, and each one is essential for its function. So probably the first thing that pops out to most people when they just look at it is there's this really bright yellow top. And this is what's called syntactic foam. It's right here, and I can pass it around. But it's very highly buoyant. And an ROV has a lot of really heavy metal parts to it. So uh, with this, we're, if we just toss it in the water, it would sink like a rock. But this, help, this helps to keep it buoyant. Um, and then once it's in the water, we have to be able to move, maneuver around in some sort of uh, aspect. So for that, we have these things called thrusters. Um, if Crystal, Crystal can show you a demo of how they work. But, yep. um, thruster check? Yep, thruster so that check. that means hands away from the, yep. the props. <laughs> <laughs> So these are basically propellers, kind of like the propellers on a motor on a boat. They spin and therefore they can propel uh, whatever it is, the RV in this case, through the water. <coughs> uh, is it loose? But nope. Once it's in there, it can, she can use it to spin and then move the RV where it wants to go. But there's one on the top here that controls vertical movement, so moving up and down. There's one here on the side, and that's for lateral movement. And then we have two here in the back, that, one you can't really see, but we have two in the back that control forward and backwards movement. And so the ROV itself, it kind of looks pretty like a really big, clunky rectangle, but the truth is that it's a really fine-tuned machine, and we can't handle it really well in the water. Um, and this is the controller that goes along with it. Uh, as you can see, it looks kind of like what you would play video games with. You have a joystick here for directional input, uh, and then you also have functions on it that let you control things like acceleration, so how fast it's moving through the water. Uh, and also there's a tilt function for a camera here so that you can see different parts of the water column. And Crystal can actually show you, so that, that camera is right here, and it's moving up and down. All the way backwards and check out the props. It goes 360 degrees. So yeah, that's kind of the important part of an ROV, is that in order to know where you're going, you have to be able to see where you're going. So like I said, this has a built-in camera, and it can uh, send video live time, real speed, up through this table and then onto the boat where Crystal is at, uh, and then it projects it onto this computer screen. Uh, and we actually have a TV, like a big regular old TV screen that we can hook up to on the boat that lets everybody see what's going on. Uh, but one thing that you'll notice is that on the screen you have uh, a, an overlay for the depth. So we have an altimeter here that tells us how deep we are in the water column, and then we also have a compass heading here. So that, that tells us which direction the ROV is pointing in degrees, so north, south, east, and west. And then sometimes the viz actually isn't too great when we go out. It can be kind of turbulent. And that visibility. Visibility. Yeah. Visibility, sorry. But sometimes it can be kind of rough out there. It can be kind of rough out there, so that kicks up sand and particles, and you get marine snow in the water. Uh, in that case, we can actually have a sonar device on this ROV. And what that does is the device sends out a ping. It can hit things around it, and then depending on like the times that those come back versus other pings that don't hit anything, we can actually get a map of what's in front of and around the ROV. And this is really similar to what sort of like a dolphin does when it echolocates. So a dolphin, it can chirp or whatever dolphin sounds they make. But they'll make those high-pitched sounds, and if it can't see in front of it, 
then I'll know if a ping hits off a fish that it wants to eat, uh, it'll hit off that fish, come back at a different time than the other uh, sounds, and it'll be able to make a uh, map in its brain of where that fish is and go eat it if it wants. So one last thing I really want to highlight about this um, is that it has two lasers on it, and this is something that Reagan's going to talk about later, but I just want to hit it really briefly. It has two lasers mounted to the front of it, so if you look at Reagan's hand, uh, this might be a better option to try this. So, you guys might be able to see these little two parallel lines here. So what those are are two lasers that point out straight like this, parallel to each other. And what happens is when a fish swims perpendicular to it, like this, we can measure both of those lines and we can measure the fish itself and get an estimate of the length of the fish without, without ever needing to bring that fish on board. So that's a really neat part of what we do with the ROV. Uh, so there, as you can tell, there's a lot of things that go into making an ROV work on the surface of the water. And one of the things that we really want to emphasize when coming up with our boardwalk talk name, Our Eyes Underwater, is the sensory aspect of it, so visually seeing. And obviously I can't use it right now underwater because we're on dry land, uh, but the closest thing I would describe it to is being like in an underwater tunnel at an aquarium, so like at the Georgia Aquarium. Um, you'll have, a lot of you have probably seen TV shows like Nat Geo or Discovery Channel, where um, they'll show a lot of underwater footage similar to what we do, but in my pers own personal opinion, the difference is that with an ROV, you can control where you go. It's like you're walking and then seeing with your own two eyes a whole nother underwater world. So transitioning a bit, uh, here in Alabama, we have a very special kind of underwater world. We have what's known as the Alabama Artificial Retirement Zone. Uh, we have a few handouts here we can pass around, but I have one up here with me. Essentially, it's all this offshore area and all these grids, and here's Dolphin Island. But what it is, is it's an area offshore uh, from maybe 20 to 60 miles out that can, is home to all sorts of artificial reefs. Uh, and historically, and still, still occurring to the state, a lot of that bottom is naturally just sand. And a lot of the fish species that live here like to relate to some sort of cover, whether uh, some sort of structure, whether it's for cover or food. Now, back in the 1950s, mm -hmm. Alabama kind of put two and two together and said, hey, why not try dumping a bunch of rubble, maybe some old car bodies down there, and see what happens. And so born out of that, all of these years later, we have things like chicken coops, and pyramids, and some other things we have are like grain, we've seen grain silos before, there, and then sunken bridges, sunken boats, and barges. Yeah, all sorts of really cool stuff. Uh, and all of this is, all of these host of things, provide really important fish habitat anywhere from right off the beach over in Gulf Shores, I'm talking like a couple hundred yards right off the beach, all the way to 60 miles offshore. And it's our job as a fisheries ecology lab, it's our job as a fisheries ecology lab to uh, study these. So one of the ways that we do that is by using a technique called vertical long line. What a vertical long line is, is essentially it's just, it's a fancy term for a line that hangs straight up and down and it has 10 hooks on it and then a sinker at the bottom. And what we do as lab is we'll send the, that down to the bottom, fish it for five minutes, reel it all the way back up, and then count what kinds of fish are on there uh, and what kinds of fish are on there. And then we can also take things like length, weight, sex. We can uh, take the gonads of the fish and the otoliths for aging if we need them. But we use the ROV and complement to that technique. So before we actually vertically long line the reef, we'll send the ROV down and look at that reef. And all of what I'm about to describe to you further in detail actually takes place on the escape, if any of you are familiar with it. It's a 65 foot charter vessel that actually, that's actually located right over there at the Islands Marina. Uh, and you can actually pay to go out fishing on the same vessel, vessel that we do research on, which I think, which I think is pretty neat. Um, what happens on a typical field day with an RV and vertical long line is that Crystal will be in the cabin of the boat with the computer and the controller, and there will be two deckhands standing off the back of the boat holding on to the ROV. And when Crystal gives the go-ahead, they'll toss it off the back, uh, and then we have a lead weight attached uh, somewhere down here that helps it sink down to the bottom. And from there, Crystal can control the ROV and move to where the structure is. And once she gets there, she'll actually, be, uh, she'll actually sit on one side of the reef, record it for a couple minutes, 
drive over to the other side of the reef, record that side for a couple of minutes for all the fish and good stuff, and then she can actually go above the reef and hover in place and look downwards and get a 360 overhead view. So once all of the video recording is done and is over with, uh, she'll tell the deckhands to bring it up, back up so they'll just hand line in the cable, it's nothing fancy. Um, and then either Reagan or I, another tech or an intern, will start reeling in this cable. So there's usually a handle on each side where we'll have to go like that. Uh, but depending on how far we off offshore, how far we are offshore, uh, that can be a lot of winding. So if we're, say, 60 miles off in our furthest grids, uh, it, we, we'll be fishing in depths of anywhere from, say, 150 foot to 200 plus feet. So on those sorts of days, uh, we start to get really buff. <laughs> <laughs> That's the workout. This weighs about 40 pounds. Yeah, although, although you tend to notice uh, one arm tends to get a bit more buff, so then you have to switch over to the other one. Just take back and forth. Um, but once we're, once we're done with that station, we'll steam off to the next one. Uh, and in a good day, we can do anywhere from seven to eight sets. I think the record is somewhere around like 10, something like that. Um, once the field work is totally done with, and uh, we're at the end of the day, we can actually take the ROV videos off of this computer by downloading them onto a flash drive. We take them back into the lab, and then Reagan here will tell you more about how we can process those videos for data. So when we get back into the lab, we begin a three-step process of going through and collecting data from the video. So the first step in this process is species composition, which sounds fancy, but it's really just us going through, watching the video, and identifying all the species that we see in it. Um, we've seen some really cool stuff. There's a couple pictures here. Um, top one is of a nurse shark, and then the bottom one is an eel. We actually saw those recently going through videos. Um, and we also get to see some cool behavior from some of the fish. So when the ROV is sitting on the bottom, a lot of times the trigger fish like to come up and they like to check out the ROV. They'll kind of like come up in front of the camera. Um, they like to sit in the wave for a while before they decide to leave. Um, and then when the ROV is going back up towards the boat, the schools of amberjack like to come up and they'll chase it back up to the surface. Which is kind of entertaining to watch. <laughs> um, so then the next step in the process is uh, abundance counts which is just us counting the fish. It just allows us to estimate about how many of each fish are on that particular reef. Um, so how we do that is we'll take five counts throughout the video, and then we'll get an average from those counts for each individual species. And then species like um, lionfish, which will kind of just sit there throughout the video. You can, they don't really move around a whole lot. They pretty much just stay in one spot. You can take a total count for those. Um, and we've seen anywhere from like one to two species in a video up to like 15 or 16. So that can be a pretty lengthy process going through, you know, 15 or 16 times for every species. Um, and the last step in the process is to take measurements of the fish. Um, so we'll take measurements on the fish and that just allows us to get the size composition of the fish on that reef. Um, and that's actually what the ROV lasers are for here that Ed was showing earlier. And, um, so in order to take measurement, the fish has to be completely in view of the camera. It can't, like the head and their tail can't be cut off. It has to be completely in the frame. Both lasers have to be visible on the fish. Um, that's right here. And uh, the fish has to be swimming like directly in front of the camera. It has to be like straight like this. Uh, it can't be like turning or moving around weird whenever the lasers hit it. Um, and we use that process to take both total length and fork length if that's available for the fish. So an advantage of using the ROV is that it allows us to see all the fish on the reef. So the fishing gear that we use is biased towards certain species. So if we just did that, we wouldn't be able to see all the species that are on the reef. So you kind of get like a total overview of everything. Um, but there are some caveats to using this. Um, one being that the visibility has to be like at least decent for us to see the fish that are there, because we have the sonar, but it doesn't allow us to see what the fish are. And then also with the cable, there's always the risk that it can get caught around something or like stuck under something. And that's actually something that we've had a problem with before. It's not a good situation. We don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, it's still here, so. <laughs> So Ed can tell you more about some of the projects that we that this data is going towards. 
Yeah, so really the overarching goal, or at least one of the overarching goals of our lab, is to be able to study these artificial reefs and how they affect uh, the populations of the fish on them. Uh, so here in the Gulf, we are blessed to have a huge diversity of fish species, many of which we use as fisheries. So we have a big commercial sector going on here where commercial fishermen will actually go out on boat, boat for weeks at a time, harvest these fish, store them, and then weeks later they'll come back to port and they can they either get distributed locally as the Gulf seafood that you see like red snapper and shrimp, or they can uh, get sent off to all corners of the US. And then on the, on the flip side of that, you also have a big recreational scene. So you have anywhere from your everyday Joe, who's a weekend warrior who likes to fish, to uh, professional fishing guides or charters. And all of these combined bring in a lot of money to the local economy. So as a fisheries ecology lab, it's important for us to be able to study the fish populations here, especially as they relate to the artificial reefs, uh, so that we can continue to sustain these fisheries and also make management decisions that will continue to sustain them. Uh, so one of the ways that we do that, one of our projects is something called NIFWIF2, and NIFWIF is just uh, the organization where the grant comes from, but it's called the National uh, Fish and Wildlife Federation. Uh, but basically what it is, is looking at community composition over time. So in other words, looking at how fish species accumulate on a reef as it continues to grow older. And the way that we do that is that we'll do a baseline survey at the beginning of the project just to see what all is out there, first of all. Once the, the structure is laid down, then we'll continue to revisit periodically over, over the course of a couple of years. And uh, ideally what happens is that it'll, it'll grow from being a barren reef to one that's filled with all sorts of fish and other life on it. Um, but Ideally, what happens uh, in between visits is that there'll be things that start to grow on it. So these structures tend to be pretty clean when we put them down. Uh, but after a couple days, a week, you'll start to get see seeing things like algae growing on it. You'll also get tiny little creatures like macaron vertebrates, macaron vertebrates, crustaceans like crabs, uh, barnacles on it. And hopefully that continues to attract things like uh, smaller forage fish. And ultimately, our goal is, is that we continue to get things like valuable game fish like red snapper, vermilion snapper, great trigger fish. And I kind of liken this as in, this is a very rough analogy, but to a forest that's just been burned down and barren. Uh, but first to come in are these, you don't, you don't immediately get big old redwoods just sprouting out of nowhere from the very ground. What you get are these quick growing grasses and shrubs, and then later on you start to transition into maybe some bigger shrubs and bushes. And then you get things like the old growth forest that you would typically have seen before that forest burned out. And we're, I'm making the analogy here that that old growth forest is what you would typically see on an artificial reef that has a lot of fish on it and a lot of life on it. Uh, so that's actually all that I have to talk about for now, but hopefully I was able to enlighten you a lot about what an ROV is, how it works, how we use it in our lab, and how we can use it going forward uh, to create sustainable fisheries management.